Hey guys, what's going on? It's your boy Luke here for our weekly DFS live stream for the PGA slate. This week we've got the CJ Cup. We're still out in Las Vegas. We've got a new track to try and take down, that being the Summit Club. A Tom Fazio design, so a little bit similar to what we saw last year at Shadow Creek. Also a Fazio design, but a little bit different when it comes to the eye. Definitely not the same visually. Going to play a little bit different as well, but I do expect a birdie fest like we saw there. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a little bit of a course review for any of you that haven't seen my course breakdown yet. We're going to talk about some weather, and then we're going to hop into my player pool, talk about the guys that I like for this week, some of the people that I'll be fading. We'll be talking about my Patreon projections, everything like that. And of course, at any point, if you have any questions for me at all, feel free to go ahead and put them down in the chat. I'll get to them when I see them. Let's go ahead and start off with the course and some of the key stats that I'll be looking at. So first and foremost, this is a course that I am relatively familiar with. I haven't played the actual course, but I played two courses directly adjacent to it. Most notably, Bears Best, which is literally directly adjacent to it. You're going to be able to see Bears Best from the Summit Club, from a lot of the overhead views and whatnot. They may even, you know, point it out. It's a Jack Nicholas design um, also on the mounds there at Summerlin. And Overall, you're going to get a ton of elevation changes. We've seen that from a lot of the pictures from the Summit Club as well. You're going to get whiskey bunkers. So the sand is very light. It's very easy to hit out of. So even when you hit off the fairways, which are ginormous here, you could land an aircraft carrier on them. Um, you're going to be all right. It's not going to be rocky or anything like that. They've done a good job with manicuring it, at least at the Bears best side. And from what we've seen at the Summit Club, we would expect very similar results. In terms of the greens, they are going to run fast. All the soil here around the mountains is extremely, extremely firm. I mean, you're dealing with bedrock essentially just inches below the soil line there. All the soil had to be imported. So balls are going to get a ton of rollout in the fairways. You're also going to be dealing with, again, firm greens. So these are relatively large greens, though. So the only defense this course is going to have, if any, is going to be if they put these pins at some crazy locations, you know, front pin locations, towards the side, that kind of thing. But Again, I expect them to want this to be a low-scoring affair, something where a guy gets out there to maybe 24, 25 under par to win. Um, so I don't expect them to do that. That would be the only defense here. You're dealing with relatively flat greens. They are flat bent grass greens. So in terms of our key stats, I really narrowed it down to three this week. My number one key stat, um, high far the number one key stat here is going to be shots gained approach. This is going to be a birdie fest. These are large greens. So you're looking at the guys that can really stuff it close and give themselves a ton of opportunity. So that's why it comes in at number one. My number two key stat, driving distance. This is a course where the bombers are definitely going to have an advantage. There are quite a few dog legs where you can take it over the desert if you're a bomber. And even if you don't end up hitting in the fairway, you end up in the desert, you're still going to be all right as well. Like I said, it's relatively well manicured. And unless you get a very unlucky lie, like sometimes we see at the Waste Management Open, you should be all right. And again, sometimes you get some great lies in that desert, so it really goes both ways. And then the last key stat I was looking at is shots gained putting. So shots gained putting makes a lot of sense, specifically on bent grass. This is going to be a birdie fest. We're going to see guys that just hold a ton of putts this week, and that's how they stay in contention. Um, so definitely making sure that I include that with my key stats. Um, a couple little bonus ones I'll be taking a look at. It's definitely going to be fairway bunker play, just because there's so much sand in play with the desert here. Uh, something I'm giving a little bit of steam to. Again, it's like four or five of my weights out of 100. And then another key set I'm looking at, birdie or better percentage. That's much more important in my stat modeling, closer to 12, 13% um, in terms of weighting. And obviously, it's because it's a birdie fest, right? We're looking for guys that can take it to 20, 25 under par. Um, so I'm making sure they have the game to do so. What I want to do now is I want to quickly share my screen, go over to the wind side of things, and start talking about some of the weather. Um, it's not going to be a massive effect this week. But definitely want to start including this here in the live stream so we can start talking about it. So let's go over here to Thursday, the October 14th. Not going to be much wind at all. You can see the max wind gusts at the afternoon of 6, 7, 6 mile an hour. That's not going to affect them at all. That's essentially standing still. Um, don't hate that at all. Let's go down here to Friday and Saturday. So on Friday, we're dealing with a little bit more wind. You can see gusts up to 12 miles an hour. But again, that's not going to affect a PGA Tour Pro. That is a relatively calm wind for the Vegas area. It's relatively flat there. So you typically deal with strong winds, you know, gusts up to 15, 20, maybe even 25 miles an hour. You're not going to get that this time. It's again, this is the worst day that we see in terms of the first two days in weather and not much of a split there at all. If you're going to talk about any type of an advantage, I guess you could say the late early would be slightly advantageous just because you only have six mile an hour winds right here. And again, you have 12 mile an hour winds there on Friday. But again, I don't expect it to make much of a difference at all. 
maybe a 0.1 shots different between like morning and afternoon wave, something like that. So nothing I'm going to be taking into consideration, but definitely wanted to at least mess mention that there. And we're, now what we're going to do is we're going to hop right into the player pool. So I want to do, talk about the weather for just a second there. And now let's bring up my Patreon projections. And before we hop into the specifics here, just want to remind you guys, if you want access to all of this data directly, you want to be able to use it for your lineup optimizing, want to be able to use it for your own calculations, make sure you guys check out my Patreon page. It's just a dollar for the month. Again, access to projections for every player in every field. Highly recommend that you guys check it out. So let's go ahead and talk about our stud options for this week. And to be quite honest with you, you can see there's three that I'm going to. Number one's DJ. If you guys saw my poor plays video from earlier on this week, you know I'm all over him. Somebody who's been putting the absolute lights out, but also somebody who's due for a lot of regression with his ball striking. So he's able to bring the putting like he has been. He regresses with the ball striking like we expect him to. He's in line for a massive week, a bunch of wins. Honestly, he should rattle off two or three wins here in the next couple months. It would not surprise me at all. We're talking about Jordan Spieth being the next guy in for me. You can see that I'm skipping over Justin Thomas and Xander Shoffley. Both of them just too highly owned for me. I like their course fits. Xander Shoffley is a hometown guy, but that's why he's garnering nearly 22% ownership. So for me, it comes down to opportunity cost. There's some lower owned options that I like a lot more. You know, first and foremost, that being Jordan Spieth. And this is a golf course that seems tailor-made for Spieth's game. If Spieth ever has a problem, it's because he's spraying it off the tee. And you can see my modeling doesn't necessarily love his game just because uh, in a lot of my modeling, it deals with driving distance, right? So driving distance is not something that Jordan Spieth is necessarily known for, but he's known for being a second, second shot specialist, right? Somebody who has some of the best irons in the world. We've seen that for the last six months from Jordan Spieth as of right now, a top five shots gain approach player over that stretch. And Somebody who I love at birdie fest. He's somebody who loves going low. Anytime you're going to see a winning score, you know, at 24, 25 under par, you know, Jordan Speed's probably going to be towards the lead. He excels in those high birdie or better percentage situations, probably because he's one of the highest birdie or better percentage players in PGA Tour history. So somebody who, again, is extremely aggressive, is not afraid to go out there and go low. Really like him, especially at nearly single digit ownership. You can see he's by far the lowest owned of the bunch up top. I love him as a leverage play, and I like him just from a median projection standpoint as well. Somebody who has the putting, especially on bent grass that I'm looking for, by far the best bent grass putter of anybody in this range. Also somebody who has the iron play that I'm looking for. Again, the only weakness you could say that Jordan Spieth has, the only detraction I can take away from this game, is the off-the-tee play. But again, this is a golf course with massive aircraft carrier size fairways, and he's not going to have to worry about that. Another guy I love this week, and it's not because he's errant off the tee or anything like that, just because he's been clicking on all cylinders, that is Rory McIlroy. So definitely getting a little bit of ownership, but obviously less than somebody like Xander or Colin Morikawa. Rory McIlroy has been on one of the best stretches of golf I think we've seen for two or three years now, to be quite honest with you, ever since before the COVID break, at least. So I guess in the last two years, um, Rory McIlroy, you can see 99, sorry, $10,100. I like the price tag there. See, he's my model's number one ranked play in the field. That is a combination of long-term form in terms of course fit and a player's recent form metrics. So not only is he a good course fit, makes perfect sense. He's a bomber, somebody he's very good with his irons when he's on. And obviously, he can fill it up on bent grass, but also somebody who short-term has looked great. He's been very good from tee to green. He's also been putting a lot better than we've been used to seeing and nearly a perfect play on the slate. I expected much higher ownership come the beginning of the week. That's why I didn't make my core plays video. It's like the next guy we're going to talk about. Um, I expected both of these players to be much higher owned than they were at the beginning of the week. Um, but the fact that they're owned where they are, they become great plays in my player pool. So they, that was Rory McIlroy again. I expected like 30% ownership on him. But Sam Burns, I expected to be mega chalk. I expected him to be like 35, 40% owned. And that's not the case. He's single digit owned. And that is blasphemous. That makes absolutely no sense. The guy's coming in with the best form of anyone in the entire world. He's a number one recent form rank for me. And in terms of a long-term rank, he's still a top 10 skill set fit for the, this golf course. And it really comes down to his length off the tee. Obviously, somebody who's one of the best in terms of at pure driving distance. And in terms of his approach play, you know, he's, he's all right. He's an above average approach player, but really does it with the putter. He's a top 10 putter in this field. So Sam Burns at $9,800. I really like the price tag. And again, that's going to scare a lot of people. Sam Burns, you know, Relatively new name on the block, at least for the elite tier. You know, he's been around for a while, hasn't really made his name though, but anyone that's been paying attention to his shots gain metrics over the last year knows that this guy's been due and he's finally getting what he's been due for, which is wins and wins and munches. Um, when you have a skill set 
where you're a top 10 off the tee player, when you can be a top 20 approach player and you're a top 10 putter consistently, that is the DJ um, blueprint right there. That is what Dustin Johnson does. Um, Dustin Johnson's the number two player in the world, has been the number one player in the world. Um, he's not number one at any one statistic, but he's great off the tee. He's great on approach at times, and he's a great putter. It is exactly what Sam Burns is. And uh, I'm not saying that he should be the number two player in the world or anything like that, but I think it's someday, maybe in the next two years, he ends up cracking that top five or even top three in the world. Uh, that's just, I'm extremely bullish on him long term, but even in the short term, um, he shouldn't be 9% owned at that price tag. I, I think that's far too low. Um, he gives you plenty of leverage up top in the small field. And just to give you guys an idea, you know, 9.6% ownership may seem a little bit high, but it's not when you consider that the average ownership of a player in this field is 7.85%. That's taking 600% ownership. You, know, you have six positions. You have 100% ownership at each position. You divide it by 78 players. That gives you the exact average ownership of a player in this field. Sandbirds is hardly above that. And normally these guys in that, you know, elite tier are two, three times X that value in terms of their ownership. And you would consider that to be a fair ownership level. Um, this isn't a guy in the 7K range. I mean, let's scroll down to show you what I mean. Um, you get down to this, uh, you know, high 6K range. You start to see they're starting to hover right around that 7, 8% mark. That's because they're lower quality players. You shouldn't be seeing that up here in the high tier range. So that makes them a very good low ownership player right there. Um, just wanted to give you guys an idea. You know, a 9.6% owned stud option is a whole lot different than a 9.6% owned 6 guy that kind of thing just just keep that in mind um brooks kepka you guys saw my fades and sleepers from today you guys know i am on brooks kepka somebody who was a fade last week for me i didn't really like the putting stats but somebody who can mentally get engaged can kind of flip that putter at any point um, i just have a weird feeling about him he's 30 to 1 i put a bet on him as well um the metrics really haven't been there of late there's nothing in the stats that really points out that he's a great play this week or anything like that you see he's my number 26 ranked golfer in the field and it's pretty dog shit for a guy up here in the high range. But just like Jordan Spieth, there's a little bit more to the numbers than what they're panning out right there. Somebody who, again, just a much higher volatility than a lot of the other players in this range. And that's why they're not as great model fits. You know, they're not going to bring their A game every single week. But when they do, they have much higher upside than somebody like, per se, even a Colin Morikawa or even, per se, somebody like a Victor Hovland. You know, Victor Hovland is... Great player, love his ball striking at all, but he lacks the high-end volatility with his putter. He's not going to go out there and ever storm a field. He just doesn't have the ability to drain enough putts. So really got to take at people's standard deviations, see whether they actually have the type of volatility to capture upside in this type of a field. And uh, for me, a lot of people are on Victor Hovland this week. You guys can see he's a fade for me. Just, just want to go over this real quick. Um, a lot of it's due to ownership, but a lot of it's just due, again, the lack of upside. He's great in weaker fields. He can go out there and dominate a weak field with his ball striking, but he can't go out and manhandle a field like this with his ball striking. It's just not going to happen. You would have to have a ceiling with the, with the putter, which happens about 5 or 6% of the time for Holland, not very often. Um, let's talk about a few other guys down here that uh, we can talk about. Finau, a fade, 18.7% ownership. That is far too high in my opinion. Um, like the course fit, you know, at least from a long-term perspective, obviously a longer player can spike with the irons, just doesn't really have the putting upside I'm looking for. And Bennett Grass is by far the worst surface for Finau's game. So don't like the vibes here. Just, again, a little bit too highly owned for me. And you see he's my number 19th ranked golfer in the field, which you can see it's highlighted here in green, which would make you think it's good, but he's the number 11th priced golfer, right? So he's nearly twice the price of where he is in terms of my model ranking. Um, don't like to see that there. Talk about other people. Sunjay M coming off the win. Highly unlikely he goes out there and repeats that performance. Again, in a much stronger field. Also, the golf course that prioritizes distance like it will. Talk about Hideki. Hideki, similar problems with um, Tony Finau. Lacks the punting upside that I'm looking for. Louis Usazen, pretty much the polar opposite of those two. Has the hottest putter on the planet right now. Um, always going to love playing Louis at these kind of birdie fests just because he has the upside to actually take it low enough. Same thing with Abraham Answer. So coming off a horrible week, but also somebody who has the volatility to take it low this kind of event high birdie or better percentage player very good on bent grass and was one of my favorite plays last week arguably my favorite play on the entire slate and yes laid a complete egg had a really shitty week went out there and lost across the board in terms of shots gained approach shots gained putting all of the kind of things that he's used to doing very well so obviously going to miss a cut if you don't have your a game with your typical strengths but this is a very good bounce back spot. You know, a golf a golf course where you have to take it low. You have to be good with your putting. I don't like his length. That's the one thing I'll say. Um, he may not end up making my pull just because I have so many guys up here marked as a yes. 
I'm actually probably going to change into more of just a, a guy I'll fit in if I can. And by the way, if you didn't know, any of these guys I have as a blank, they're people that I'm not necessarily excluding from my pool, but I'm not trying to fit them into lineups. If they end up making my player pool come the end of the night, so be it. Um, Abraham Manser is probably going to be one of those people for me as well. Same thing with Cam Smith. Um, don't like the off the tee play, right? So very similar players right there. Good with their short game. Um, can get it done with their irons at times. Um, I would definitely like answer over Smith, though, for what it's worth. Keep going down here. And I'll remind you guys, anyone in here listening, if you guys have any questions at any point, make sure to go ahead and put them down in the chat. It can be a player that we're talking about that you want a little bit more information on. You can bring up their shots game metrics, those kind of things. Or it can be a question in terms of selecting players, right? You know, one-on-one, -on -one, do I choose this guy, do I choose this guy? Or game theory questions, anything you want to talk about, just reminding you guys. Um, getting down to this next price tier, so getting out away from these studs and whatnot. Um, we're going to talk about the guy $7,500 up to $9,000 now. First and foremost, Scotty Scheffler was huge on him last week. Had a very disappointing performance. I mean, just like Abraham Answer, not, not a very good week, right? But it was coming in with very good form, was somebody that I thought would have a very good bounce back performance, and he didn't. You know, it's going to happen from time to time. People are going to grade out very well, and they're going to have bad weeks. But here at the Summit Club, he's an even better course fit, in my opinion. Somebody who's very good off the tee, obviously one of the elite distance players on tour. Obviously very good as a bent grass putter as well. So hybrid or better percentage player. So tip, just like Abraham Answer, very similar boat, except he has a better off the tee game. You know, it's going to hit the ball farther than Answer. And I think that makes a difference. Why I'm willing to go back to him and not necessarily Abraham Answer. It's got a question in here. Gone late. Munoz this week. Playing so bad, I like him. He's off the map. You hit the nail on the head right there. Not going to lie. You play Munoz when he looks like he's not a play at all. The guy will go on six straight missed cuts and turn it into a win. We saw it last year at the Sanderson Farms. It's a, a thing. You're right. Um, I believe he's like $6,300, $6,200 as well. Um, yeah, he's in my pool as a flyer play this week. Um, I think he's even getting some ownership, but I don't care. Um, Munoz, again, a volatile guy that can go out there and get you at a 25 under par. Um, speaking of volatility, we got Jason Kokrak, guys, who has been all over the map of late. If you take a look at his performances in terms of finishes, um, you're going to think that he's in one of the worst stretches of golf in his career, and he's quite frankly not. He's going out there. He's top five in this field and birdie or better percentage. He's quite frankly been a little bit unlucky. And what I'm talking about, and I have a few instances to talk about. So first of all, the Wyndham Championship, he had a tee shot on the easiest hole in the golf course. It was a par five, and there's one patch of fescue at the entire um, Sedgefield Country Club where they play the Wyndham Championship. Um, it's on a par five. It's like off to the right, um, and there's even two – Volunteers standing in that patch of fescue looking for golf balls just in case. Jason Kirkai hits a tee shot into the water over that patch of fescue. Instead of taking a drop because the fescue is right there, he's like, all right, I'm just going to re-tee. Fuck it. He went out there. He re-tees. He hits it into the fescue and has a lost ball. And, yes, there were two volunteers literally standing right next to where the ball is. They could not find it. Extremely unlucky right there. He ends up missing the cut there on the number. Fought back even though he was having all those unlucky breaks. Now let's talk about last week at the Shriners. Misses the cut on the number. Same kind of thing. His second day, he started at four under. All he had to do was go out there and shoot one under to make the cut of that golf tournament. Loses over two strokes putting in the second round. On his best surface, which is bent grass. That's just something that does not happen to Jason Kokrak. Um, he's been ever so close. He's missed the cut by one stroke twice. Um, if you take a look at his shots gain numbers, he's gaining on approach, gaining off the tee. Even gaining with his putting, even with the you know two and a half strokes lost, that kind of thing. So here's some crack rack. Uh, I'm going right back to him. Um, there's this negative sentiment on him that just isn't reality. You can see he's my number seven ranked golfer in the field. Um, I'm extremely bullish about his chances this week. Um, Terrell Hand, I'm okay with. He's great at no cut events. Just has a good track record at them. Um, maybe it's because of his aggressiveness. His great aggressive nature. Right, somebody who's going to go out there, fire at every single pin, and when he doesn't stick it to five feet, he's going to drop f bombs left and right. Right, so that's just that's just how he is. Um, I like him at these no cut events because he's not going to get as mad. Right, if he has one of those bad shots that he's definitely due to have, um, not going to blow up quite as much. Perhaps that's why he's had that success. By the way, at least that's my theory on it. Uh, if you guys have any other theories why Terrell Hines so good at no cut events, same thing with Justin Thomas. You know, he's a fiery dude. Um, that's why I think he's so good at these no cut events. Is you know he's able to brush that aside. He's not worrying about that cut. Um, you guys can let me know if you have a different theory, but that's that's what I think it is. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, let's talk about Patrick Reed. This, this could go horribly, right? But at least he's only 4.9% owned. I'm going to have 15% Reed just because I think 4.9% is borderline disrespectful. Um, he's somebody who doesn't have a great course fit here. I mean, he's wild off the tee, so at least he's going to be able to land it on some type of grass. I mean, they have 
these massive ass fairways. Um, so I like that portion of his game. It's just the shots gain metrics are horrendous. I mean, that's why he's a 31 ranked golfer um, in this field. Um, it's the recent form metrics. It's not the course fit metrics. Of course, fit metrics, he's great. You know, he's good on bent grass in terms of putting. It's his second best surface. Good on approach, at least for his 2020 stats. But when we take a look at the uh, the recent form, it's no good. So if you're somebody who loves to rely on recent form metrics, will not play somebody coming in with bad form, then by all means, fade Patrick Reed, right? But he's only 4.9% owned. So for GPPs, it's a no-brainer play for me. Somebody who has shown the ability to flip the sh switch in the past, um, I mean, won the Farmers Insurance Open literally the week that he changed his swing and his coach. Um, switched uh, peak to peak Cowan, I believe, as a swing coach, and literally that week won a golf tournament. And he's changed his entire swing plane. He went from hitting primarily all draws to a more balanced swing plane. He was able to hit draws. Now he's able to hit fades. And we've actually seen him struggle because of that. I think at first it was a great change to his game. You know, gave him a lot more ability. It gave him a lot more flexibility out there on the golf course. But now he's starting to spray it a little bit. So there's obviously a little bit of concern there. Um, especially because I, I paid so much attention to his game. I, I've seen how that's evolved over time. But again, somebody who's shown the ability to flip that switch. So I like going there in GPPs. Probably would avoid it in cash contests. Um, Kevin Nall, we're going to have to make sure he's actually playing. So he had a rib injury last week, ended up withdrawing from the Shriners. Um, reports are, at least speculation at this point, was it was just preventative. Didn't want to hurt himself before the CJ Cup. I mean, at the CJ Cup, if you go out there, you finish in last place, you make over $180,000. So not going to suck if you go out there and you have a really bad week. Um, so Kevin Na probably just wanted to make sure he didn't get injured so he could cash the check this week. I like him as a play again. He's a hometown guy. He's probably played the Summit Club a lot more than most. Um, not as much as some of the members here like Colin Morikawa, somebody like Maverick Mealy. We're going to get to here in a second. But I like the familiarity. I like his bent grass splits. Um, don't love the distance off the tee, though. So if we get any semblance of a word that he's going to be injured or questionable at all to tee it up at any point this weekend, he'll get immediately dropped from my pool. There's just no reason to take on that risk, especially because he's at 10% ownership right now. Um, he's just, yeah, it's it's a little bit riskier than I want to be if we get some type of a negative report tomorrow, but I don't expect that. I expect him to be in my pool. Uh, I'll talk about these guys at $7,400. They're arguably my favorite plays on this entire price range, I'd say. So let's start with Aaron Wise, um, somebody who's been putting the absolute lights out of late. He's been a neutral putter since July 1st. And to be quite honest with you, that's probably the first time in his career he's gone on a two, three month stretch and had at least a neutral putter. It just doesn't happen for Aaron Wise. He's atrocious with the flat stick. Um, he's changed to the broomstick putter, the Adam Scott um, type putter, if you guys have seen that before. Um, and it's worked. He's been grinding over it. I've heard reports from people saying that they've seen Aaron Wise stay at least an hour after every single round putting. Um, it's clearly working, so I, I want to go there. Somebody who's really good from tee to green. If he can go out there and gain a stroke or two putting, he could win this damn thing, not just contend. So I um, really like that there. Um, somebody I actually have an outright bet on as well. We're going to talk about Joaquin Neiman now. Neiman, somebody I'm extremely bullish on as well. A very shaky end of the 2021 season. Um, not really what he wanted to see from him ball striking wise. Also lost the putter, which can be a little bit tricky with Neiman. You know, he typically relies on that putter, but last week at the Shriners turned it around in a big way, had a very good Friday, also a very good Saturday round, um, faltered on Thursday and Sunday. That's why he didn't find himself in contention, but was striking the ball well, was putting the ball well as well. So definitely like that at all. Got another comment down in your chat. I play no golfer that has been recently married like Hatton. Their heads are messed up. I mean, yeah, you got to question their judgment, right? They're going out there and uh, getting themselves married. Like what Clearly something's wrong in their head, right? <laughs> uh, let's go down to a few of these guys here, like Maverick McNeely. Um, Maverick McNeely, $7,300. Um, I really like going to him. He's the guy that, with the home course uh, boost, just like Colin Morikawa, except he's $7,300. You're not spending up for that guy in the $10,000 range. He's also coming in with just 10, oh, I'm sorry, 13% ownership. It's reading the wrong number there. Um, as opposed to 24% ownership. So and I'm going to give one of these chalky guys that's a member at this golf course. I'd rather it be the much cheaper of the two options. McNeely also has a better course fit, in my opinion. McNeely is one of the longer players on tour, and he usually doesn't get a rep for that. Usually because he's, you know, usually because people expect him to be this small, scrawny guy, and he is. But he's also somebody who's most flexibility of anyone I've seen since Rory McIlroy, to be quite honest with you. And he leverages that distance like no other. Kind of like somebody like a Joaquin Neiman does. You know, he's not a big guy or anything like that, 
but he can carry 320 yards, that kind of thing. So do you like Maverick Neely in this situation? Obviously a very good putter on bent grass. Again, has that distance that I'm talking about. Just doesn't have the approach play. You, know, you never know when he's going to bring the irons with him. Um, can he eject himself from tournaments with his irons from time to time? Um, so not going to be somebody I have like 30, 40% of this week, but 25, 30% seems like a good number for me. Alex Noren has been great, not just on the PGA Tour to end last season. Um, it's very good in the playoffs. Also good internationally. He has a few top 25 finishes. Hasn't missed a cut, I believe, seven or eight events. Um, obviously no cut this week, so we're not worrying about that. But you like that kind of recent form. You obviously know that his swing is in good order there. Um, you can see I have him in my pool. Don't hate going to him at all. Um, Cameron, Cameron Tringale, um, not, not playing him. He's uh, he's good at birdie fest, but he's also short off the tee and – I cannot stand playing Cameron Tringale. It's it's an experience. If uh, if you've played him enough in the past, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Russell Henley right there at 10.75%. Not a huge fan of his splits on bent grass. More of a Bermuda grass specialist. Um, also does it with the accuracy off the tee, not necessarily his distance. So somebody kind of like those accuracy specialists before that I've started to avoid. Um, just not a priority for me, for me this week. Um, Jason Day, I'll, I'll save you your five entries, your... 25 bucks or whatever you're going to put on Jason Day. Don't do it. Um, we'll just leave it there. I, I probably don't even have to explain it. If you, if you would like me to, I can. You can put a question down in the chat. But he's been atrocious for a long time now. Um, Ian Poulter, 5.55% ownership. I may He may end up making my pool. right? If I need more players to fit up my 150 lineups, he'd be one of the first guys added in this type of range. Um, just don't like the off the tee play. Has very good bent grass splits. Somebody who is coming in with relatively good form. I think a lot of people... Um, are kind of discounting that fact. You know, he's been really good for the last year. Um, doesn't have any wins or anything like that to write home about, but a lot of consistent made cuts and that kind of thing. And uh, if you're looking for that in a cash game, I don't hate it at all. Um, but again, he's not in my pool as of right now, but a prime candidate to get added. Gary Woodland, anytime you're at a golf course where you can spray it off the tee, at least for the last two years, um, that's been his MO. You want to play Gary Woodland, obviously one of the longer players. So I'd like the little bit of a distance boost that he gets. Um, haven't looked at his bent gas fish splits, would have to take a look at that. Um, I'll take a look after this video if it's anything notable and put it down in the comments. But Gary Woodland, you know, good putter in general, has that distance I'm looking for. Um, the approach play hasn't really been there for quite some time. That's why we haven't ha had any noise from Gary Woodland. I mean, he's a guy who's won a major championship, right? You'd expect him to be a little bit more of a figurehead on the PGA Tour at this point. Just hasn't been himself for quite some time. Um, so again, he's only being owned in less than 3% of lineups, which... Frankly, it doesn't make sense to me. He probably should be closer to 7%, 8%. Um, that's where I'm going to have him in my pool at the very least. I'm talking about uh, Kevin Stroman. Kevin Stroman's always underrated. Don't understand what it is about him. People just don't like playing him. You know, he just doesn't get a ton of steam. He's not a sexy player by any means. Um, not doing, not flashy. He's not going out there on uh, social media and lighting it up or anything like that. But Kevin Stroman, very consistent game. A lot longer than people give him credit for. You know, a lot of people will take him for a plotter, but that's just not the case. He has over a 307 yard average in terms of his drives. Also, somebody you can get it done with the putter from time to time. You know, a little bit volatile with that putter, but when I'm investing in players that's slow in GPPs, that's what I'm looking for. People that have that volatile upside. Um, so you can see I'm gonna have him probably around 10-15% of my lineups. Um, we'll have to see. I'm a little bit more bullish about these guys, price a little bit lower. So you can see all these guys as a yes from like $6,400 down. Um, they are actually getting more ownership. People are going the studs and duds approach this week. That's also the way I see myself building lineups. I love some of these guys down low that we're going to get to here in a minute. Um, a few other guys up here I want to talk about before we get to some of my favorite plays on the slate. And yeah, I'm, I'm that bullish about these guys. Down low. <laughs> they are some of my favorite plays on the slate. We'll get to them. Um, Eric Van Royens, number one. He was somebody who was my number one value play last week and uh, boy, did that burn up in my face. Uh, just like Scotty Shuffler. Um, was coming in with great form as a relatively good course fit and uh, went out and was an absolute shitter. So um, don't expect that to continue from Eric Van Royen. I mean, God knows what happened to him last week. Could have been out with Sebastian Munoz. Could have been out um, a few of the other guys that missed the cut last week and uh, was partying it up or something. I mean, anything could have been the reason for that, right? He was coming in with great form. Um, if we take a look at his long-term form coming in, though, over the last 24 rounds, um, very good in terms of birdie or better percentage. He's a top 15 player in the field. Good with his irons. He's a top 25 player in the field. And in terms of his off the tee play, also top 15. So just all over the board, relatively good, above average at everything. Um, so $6,700, I like going back to him. He's projected in 7.5% of lineups right now. I expect that to be coming lower. I expect it to come in 
closer to five, maybe five and a half percent, just because people are going to be scared off that missed cut. Now let's get into these guys that I absolutely love this week. I'm almost playing two of these guys in every single lineup of the guys that are priced below this. Um, first and foremost, Cam Davis, my favorite value play on the slate. Somebody who's very long off the tee, can get it done with the irons from time to time. And that's the real contingency with him this week. He needs to bring the irons. You know, that's not something that we can necessarily rely on him from. But he's an amazing bent grass putter. He has the biggest split of anybody on the PGA Tour, at least in my database, between their average putting stats and their splits on bent grass. Gains 0.56 shots gained per round on bent grass. He's a loser on every other surface. It's a, a glaring weakness in his game on every other surface, but something that he actually taps into on bent grass. And I would be extremely curious to know why that's the case. If I ever get a chance to interview Cam Davis at some point in my career, I will 100 million percent ask him why. Um, he probably doesn't even know himself. If I uh, brought up the splits on bent grass, he might not even know that he's so good on bent grass, but uh, maybe he does. Maybe uh, every time he gets onto it, he just sees the lines better uh, Definitely want to hear about that, but love him this week. He's a hybrid or better percentage player, someone I like going to. Um, I want to talk about the other guys I'm bullish on. I'm not as bullish on Ricky Fowler. We'll talk about him, though. I'm going to have him at least. Really bullish on Jonathan Vegas, though. Again, very good off the tee. Hybrid or better, better percentage player. And over the last 24 measured rounds, he's top 10 in shots gained approach. So really checks all the boxes you're looking for. You can see he's a top 15 stat fit, even down here at $6,300. So even though he's nearly 10% owned, that is more than warranted. I'm going to probably have him in about 20, 25% of my lineups. I um, really like the way that he grades out this week. A few other guys that I'm taking a look at down low that I really like this week. One is Mackenzie Hughes. And that may come as a massive surprise to some. Um, it, it did to me at first because when, when I was taking a look at some of the driving distance numbers, um, Mackenzie Hughes averages over 305 yards per drive since in his last six months. So to start the 2021, 2020, 2021 season was just averaging 289 yards of drive. He was one of the shorter hitters on tour and it was a glaring weakness. But if we narrow that down to the last six months, he's averaging an additional eight yards of drive, um, sometimes up to 15 yards of drive in some of these events. And it, it makes me wonder if he changed his equipment. Um, I, again, something I, I would love to, to dive into more because you don't just gain eight yards of distance out of nowhere. I mean, seemingly, right. And if you can give me eight yards of distance on my driver, let me know now in the chat, right. I would, would love to figure that out, but somebody who was never accurate off the tee, he's still very inaccurate off the tee, but picked up a lot of distance. So we've seen Mackenzie Hughes at some hard golf courses have a lot of success. And I think that's because of his type of game that he plays. He's somebody who's very good with the putter very good in terms of his um, scrambling ability, obviously um, makes some putts from 40, 50 feet that no one else on the tour is capable of making. Uh, I, I like him at these high tier fields, you know, where you have the very best players in the world. For some reason, Mackenzie Hughes seems to find a way. Um, so seemingly you can see he's one of the worst plays on the slate in terms of my modeling, he's 65 out of 78. Um, most of the guys in that 70 range, by the way, are court Korean tour players like down here, you know, so I can't even say his name, Kim, um, Shin, that kind of thing. Um, he's he's just ranked above them. So take it with a grain of salt. The modeling does not like Mackenzie Hughes this week, but somebody who seems to make it happen in these high quality fields, especially at golf tournaments where off the tee accuracy is not as important. So um, definitely something I'm taking a look at there. Next option here I want to talk about is Keith Mitchell at $6,200. So he's my model's number 55th ranked play. A lot of that's due to his volatility. You know, he's somebody who isn't going to go out there and be Mr. Consistency, make cuts or that kind of thing, but high birdie or better percentage player, somebody who's a very good putter at times. And uh, at $6,200 at 1.3% ownership, I definitely think he's at least worth a few stabs in GPP contests. Let's talk about Ricky Fowler because I wanted to skip over him because he's not somebody I'm extremely bullish on this week, but there's going to be a golf course where Ricky Fowler is going to turn things around. It's going to be at a place where you can just completely spray it off the tee, right? place like this where you can fit an aircraft carrier on these fairways um if you guys have seen some of the overhead views these things are massive i mean it was it's a true resort course it's meant for the membership not for pga tour pros um so Ricky fowler not going to have problems off the tee has found the approach play at times of late has gained over two strokes on approach three of his last five events he's also been decent with the putter i mean he's had a few shots gained performances of over five shots gained putting over his last few months of play so if you can find a way to bring the irons and the putter to this golf course at $6,400, you can do a whole lot worse. I mean, if I told you two years ago that Ricky Fowler was going to be $6,400, you tell me that I'm on drugs or something like that. So 
definitely somebody who, again, a much higher pedigree player than everyone else in that price range. So again, thank you guys for stopping by for the live stream. Um, I'm going to be logging off now, but if you guys have any questions, go ahead and feel free to put them down in the chat. I'll get to them when I can, but until next time, see ya.